Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, or good evening to everyone that is following us uh, online. Today we are back to, um, uh, to the policy symposium that we're having this, uh, this week. For those uh, who are following us, we have started this series of conferences last November with a technical, um, com space sim uh, technical symposium on the different aspects that uh, are leading now to the Summit of the Future. They are the space traffic management, space resources and space debris. And today we have the day dedicated to space resources. We have uh, a great panel today to, to help us and guide us uh, and discuss this um, very important topic that was uh, one of the points defined by the Secretary General in his policy brief. And uh, today I would like to introduce our moderator. Our moderator is Dr. Artemis uh, Papatas. Nasorio, sorry for her mispronunciation. She's uh, the head of the International Law Department of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece, and she's specialized in public uh, international law, also in particular on issues on international space law, international law on civil aviation, and international cultural and property law. She has participated in part and participates in large number of bilateral and multilateral negotiations representing her country, Greece, in the UN General Assembly, in the Sixth Committee, in the UN Committee of, on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUS, and International Ato Ato Atomic Energy Agency at UNESCO and UNESCO. She has participated as invited lecturer and panelist in several international conferences, and sh uh, she's the author of several articles on issues of space international law. With this, Dr. Artemis, I would like to thank you very much uh, to joining us as, uh, as moderator, and I will now give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Um, it's my honor, and thank you very much for the invitation by the Portuguese Space Agency to be here today with you. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, um, it is a great pleasure for me to be the moderator of this panel of distinguished experts on the very important uh, if not extremely timely, issue of space resource activities. The purpose of our panel, as was also said by Hugo, is to take advantage of and further exploit, in terms of policy, the inputs of the November 2023 Technical Symposium in view of the forthcoming Lisbon Conference of May 2024 and overall the UN Summit for the Future. In the For All Humanity Future, uh, the Future of Outer Space Governance, our Common Agenda Policy Brief 7, the UN Secretary General recommends to Member States, and in particular to COPOS, among others, to develop an effective framework for sustainable exploration, exploitation and utilization of the Moon and other celestial bodies. This framework could include binding and non-legally binding aspects and should build upon the five UN treaties on outer space and other instruments for international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space. For my part, before proceeding to the presentation of our speakers, I consider it important to highlight some among the conclusive assertions of the November 2023 uh, Technical Symposium on the subject of space resources activities, and I quote, Regulation is needed to ensure legal certainty. It should not be too restrictive to allow economic growth, but at the same time it should ensure that space is available for future generations. Another one, with some of the developments happening, activities are speeding up and are testing the boundaries of currently existing legal frameworks. I conclude with the assertion of the UN Secretary General in its policy brief that without agreed international principles on activities in the exploration, exploitation, and utilization of space resources, these economic incentives carry a potential risk of conflict, environmental degradation, and cultural loss. Uh, I will now present our first speaker, Dr. Tanya Malson. Uh, Tanya, Dr. Uh, Malson uh, is an assistant professor and deputy director of the International Institute of Earth and Space Law at Leiden University and president emerita of the International Institute of Space Law. She is vice president for science and academic relations of the International Astronautical Federation. Tanya advises the Dutch government and other institutions on space law issues and was co-founder of the Hague International Space Resources Governance Group, Working Group. 
The Dutch government appointed her as arbitrator for space-related disputes at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. She teaches at universities worldwide and is global faculty at International Space University. She serves on various organizations' advisory boards, including Open Lunar Foundation, the Interplanetary Initiative of Arizona State University, and the Space Sustainability Rating. She sits on the board of editors of Air and Space Law. Kluber. She is a recipient of several awards and is a member of honor of the Netherlands Space Society. In 2020, Tanya received a royal decoration as officer in the Order of Orange Nassau for her work in the field of space law. And I conclude here because she has a, an impressive CV. <laughs> so, Tanya, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Artemis. And uh, wait. I think I need to quit and reopen. I'm so sorry, but there seems to be a setting okay. that is not. I will do that. I'm very sorry. Or perhaps you want to give the floor first to someone else and then I follow. Okay, I'm so sorry. I will proceed with uh, Gerald Sanders then. Um, okay. So okay, uh, I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Gerald Sanders. Uh, is a lead for in situ space resource utilization and has worked full time at the NASA Johnson Space Center since 1987 in the propulsion and power division of the engineering directorate. Um, he has uh, extensive experience in chemical propulsion, fluid systems, and in situ resource utilization. In the area of ISRU, he has supported or led most major architecture studies, studies technology road mapping, and hardware development activities associated with Mars and lunar, lunar ISRU within the agency since 1996. His responsibilities have included planning, scheduling, budgeting, and coordinating ISRU technology and development activities at the NASA Johnson Space Center with other NASA centers, government agencies, industry, academia, and other international space agencies. Beside ISRU, he has worked extensively in the area of crewed vehicle and in space chemical propulsion development. So, Gerald, you have the floor. You can proceed with your PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so hopefully it's being shared at the moment. Um, yeah. I want to thank you and the organizers for allowing me to give a brief discussion on how NASA is starting to pursue lunar resource understanding, extraction, and eventual use of these extracted and derived products. Since I mostly talk to technical audiences, in the next few minutes I have, I'm going to flash through a number of slides while I discuss the main points of each of those. And let me see if I can do so. So, um, to begin with, this is these are the images that I saw when I first started to work on space resources uh, and in situ resource utilization in the mid '90s. These images were big, showed vast plans, um, but interestingly, at the time, very little work had actually been done on developing the technologies for space resources, and most of the work had been done in very small labs. Working for NASA um, since the 90s on space resources, um, most of the work was focused on very particular miss mission usage um, and development was aimed solely at, at that limited usage. And, uh, and around the 2020 timeframe, we were directed to think longer, to envision where each of our capabilities should be in 20, 30, 40 years from today, and use that as a guidepost for, treat for creating strategic plans and development roadmaps. This is what we created and it stresses the long-term goals such as industrial scale uh, and creation of sustainable commodities. And we chose the word commodities versus consumables uh, very carefully because we wanted to show that at some point we would actually want to try to commercialize and sell these. Um, looking at the chart, the biggest focus uh, for space resources in ISRU is the production of water, oxygen, metals, and propellant in the top left corner as well as the, the support for economical and reusable space transportation systems on the bottom uh, right. 
in the longer term, we also want to support the manufacturing, construction, and long-term human activities on the, on the lunar surface as well. So a lot goes into um, what it takes to do space resources. There are a number of international, U.S., and even internal NASA policies, policies and directions that drive our work. What we are doing and understanding the space resources and working towards what, what it would take to extract them. We believe that space resources are vital to the nation, exploration, science, and economic growth that we encourage our international support for civil exploration and private recovery of these resources consistent with the Outer Space Treaty. That since we do not know at this point if it's technically or even economically feasible to extract and use these resources, that governments do play an important role as uh, to uh, develop these capabilities as well as establishing a common set of rules. And we're trying to set out a common vision and principles with our other um, Artemis Accord signatures as a starting point. And forums such as this are incredibly important to enable this vision and principles going forward. In 2022, NASA released the um, Moon to Mars uh, Strategic and Objectives document. And within this document, there was this Venn diagram that you see on the left as to why do we go into space? And it has three major pillars, science, national posture, and inspiration. And in the intersection of these three pillars is obviously the most important reason. So on the right, I've listed some of those ways that space resources and utilization fit into this Venn diagram. There are terrestrial benefits, especially with respect to renewable energy, CO2 reduction and recycling and such. There's commercialization and spinoffs. There's, there's leadership aspects, as well as establishing the norms and policies uh, associated with space mining that, that we're talking about today. Now, this is a pretty busy chart, um, and I usually use this when technical uh, audiences. But the bottom line is that a lot goes into where you select sites for future resource utilization activities. It's not just whether the resource is there, um, but it's what is the form and concentration? Is it, uh, is it economical to extract it and use it for a longer period of time? So there's other aspects like, is can I generate power? Is the terrain reasonable for performing operations? Um, can I establish support infrastructure and customers nearby? These are these factors all have to play into it. And so if you look at the bottom middle, it's kind of like all these different things need to come into how you select. So early on, when we don't have a lot of infrastructure, we may need to be looking at what I'll call a Goldilocks locations, especially when we're thinking about where water might be in permanently shadowed craters. We're not going to be mining those huge 20 kilometer craters at any time soon. We're probably going to be looking into smaller ones, for example. Um, safety is paramount for human space exploration. Before any new technology can be put into a human exploration mission, it has to have been adequately demonstrated. And there's always been a chicken and the egg issue with respect to space resources and ISRU in the past in that it hadn't been proven. And so if it's, if it's not proven and part of the importance for the architecture, then the priority for funding is lower and it never gets inserted. So a few years ago, the Space Technology Program and NASA agreed to try to break this chicken and the egg cycle by developing technologies and performing demonstrations that would get us to what we call a pilot plant, the first small-scale end-to-end demonstration of all the pieces that go into it um, and, and operate it for a period of time and at a scale that would reduce the risk um, going forward. And so this is kind of our notional plan at the moment where one or two demonstrations would occur. And we're looking at two different pathways, one that deals with water and volatiles in the permanently shadow crater, and one that deals with the regolith that exists all over the moon. I also want to point out that uh, within the Moon to Mars strategic and objective document, there are also objectives specifically associated with the responsible space exploration and the use of space. 
and I've extracted four of these objectives um, on the bottom left that document um, how we might be, what objectives associated with space resource extraction and utilization. NASA takes performing space mining responsibility very seriously and is looking at how to implement considerations to do so from the start. After examining and talking to representatives from terrestrial mining and processing communities, we released a paper on the subject last year at, at a technical conference, AIAA Ascend, that begins to address these objectives and items we need to consider going forward. What the drivers are, how do they affect the design and operations, how do we maximize science and minimize environmental impacts, and the need for consultation when de-conflicting de of space resource activities. And I'd like to conclude um, with some, some takeaway points. We believe that space mining will reduce mission and architecture mass and costs. It will allow for fewer launches as well as um, allowing for more independence. So that would increase our capabilities as well as uh, increase our safety. We believe that learning to use these space resources in a step-by-step -step manner on the moon will actually help us on Earth in many different ways and that planetary preservation and making sure that we um, are environmentally and culturally uh, uh, applicable uh, are important responsibilities in using space resources. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. So uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Gerald, uh, for this very important uh, um, uh, presentation. Uh, although not being a technician and an expert in uh, in situ uh, resource utilization, uh, I can admit that I understood uh, almost everything, and uh, um, I retain because I, a lot of questions came to my mind. But I will address uh, them to you later on. But I just okay. uh, I just retain uh, that um, as you underlined in the last. Uh, um, um, image of your PowerPoint, planetary preservation is important in responsibly using space resources. Thank you very much. And now I, I will uh, um, pass the floor to Tanya. And, um, and Dr. Tanya Masson is an assistant professor and deputy director of the International Institute of Earth and Space Law at Leiden University. And I, President miss, Samarita, I think uh, I, I, yes, I spoke yeah, about so I don't uh, the think CV, it's so I not, uh, yes. So Tanya, repeat. you have the floor, please proceed. Thank you so much, Artemis. And again, sorry for the glitch just now. Do you see my slides now? Is it yes. uh, visible? Okay, wonderful. So uh, I think actually this turned out nice because it was very nice to have this setting of the scene of uh, what is possible and what our ambitions can be before going into the legal uh, developments and, and situations. So what I would like to do is to tell you a little bit what is the current law, what are the initiatives and what we can expect and what we should be striving for. Um, and uh, I, I would like to remind that we have a number of international treaties that have been adopted by the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. I've put in bold here the first and the last, which are particularly relevant for space resource activities. So the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and uh, to a lesser extent, the Moon Agreement of 1979. So these are international treaties that are binding on the parties that have um, uh, agreed to be bound by them. The Outer Space Treaty currently has 114 uh, state parties and it has several articles that are relevant for this activity. For instance, outer space is free for exploration and use and such exploration and use shall be uh, in the interest of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. On the other hand, no one can own ownership. There is no sovereignty in outer space. Also important is the fact that private activities, which will be a major element of space resource activities, have to be supervised and authorized <clears throat> by their state. So there is a state system of responsibility, just as there is also a state system of liability. 
And so here also the importance of having solid national frameworks in place is important. Um, Article 9, I want to mention it specifically also because it is about uh, the avoidance of harmful uh, interference and harmful contamination. Uh, if there is interference, for instance, of two mining activities on the moon, uh, states have to consult with each other. So there is no clear prohibition of such interference, but there is a duty to enter into appropriate international consultations. Uh, so these are all uh, elements that have to be taken into account, even though the treaty does not specifically address whether space resource activities are, are legitimate or not, or how they should be governed, which is why this governance topic is now high on the agenda, because we see that uh, activities are starting to be developed and will no doubt soon occur. We also have another agreement, the Moon Agreement of 1979, which has 18 minus one nowadays parties, so much, much less than the Outer Space Treaty. Only 17 start, uh, states parties with the uh, withdrawal of Saudi Arabia earlier this year. And it sort of repeats some of the principles of the Outer Space Treaty, that there is uh, uh, exploration and use that are free. They are the province of all mankind. It goes a bit further in saying that we can also collect and remove samples for scientific uh, uh, investigation and there is a stronger article about uh, the environmental protection so that uh, the disruption of the existing balance should uh, should not occur. The main article of relevance here is article 11 because that is about uh, the, uh, the moon and its resources being the common heritage of mankind and that is likely the reason why so few sta states have ratified this treaty because this concept is not uh, is controversial and is per perhaps not always understood. What Article 11 also does, and that is, I think, very reasonable, it says once exploitation of resources is about to become feasible, states should come together and make a regime to manage uh, those activities. And that's, of course, exactly what we are going to do now. And so um, even though the treaty has limited relevance because of its low number of parties, the provisions are still useful to look at. Um, in uh, uh, the governance of these activities, we can look at also what national law has been doing because international law has not given us very clear answers. Uh, national laws have started to emerge and we have so far four national laws that deal with space mining, if you like. USA was, of course, the first followed by Luxembourg and then the United Arab Emirates and Japan. I personally hope that there will not be others who do this. I also think that this uh, establishment of these national laws was probably necessary to kick off the debate and to, to really show the urgency that uh, some um, international discussions were taking place. Immediately after the US law was adopted, for instance, an agenda item was adopted by UN COPOS to discuss this in an international forum. Basically what these laws do, all is to uh, acknowledge that private entities can own uh, natural resources and they can uh, sell them and transform them and mine them and so on. Um, we also have other initiatives by non-governmental organizations and you mentioned in my introduction already the Hague Working Group, which I'm proud to have co-founded, which came up with some building blocks, 20 building blocks, so elements for a governance regime uh, a few years ago, which uh, are now also on the table in the UN. They were formally introduced by the Netherlands and Luxembourg to UN COPOS. Um, and they are quite detailed in uh, suggestions for states to take up when formulating a governance framework for space resource activities. There are also other provisions, uh, uh, proposals like the Vancouver recommendations or the Moon Village Association's activities or even Space Generation Advisory Council with the young uh, uh, space professionals, which is of course important because this affects their future and uh, the, the respect for the interests of future generations is nowadays acknowledged as very important.
A few words about the Artemis Accords and uh, the International Lunar Research Station initiatives uh, in the United States. An, uh, an executive order was issued by the Trump administration that was very critical of the Moon Agreement uh, and made clear that the United States would never accede to that treaty and also stating that outer space is not a global commons. Um, I don't know if the current administration uh, still agrees with that. The executive order has not been rescinded. Uh, so it's still out there. And um, if outer space is not a global commons, I wonder what it is. But uh, otherwise, this was uh, followed by uh, the Artemis Accords, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, which is not a legally bounding, binding uh, document, but it is a political agreement uh, concluded between NASA and, and foreign partners. Currently has 36 signatories, so that uh, I think in the last year it was uh, 10 or 12 who have uh, uh, who have joined which consists of 10 principles, some of which repeat principles of the Outer Space Treaty uh, and some of which are new, for instance, the protection of a heritage site or uh, the uh, interoperability principles and most importantly, uh, the principle about deconfliction of activities, which include the sometimes uh, controversial, seen as controversial uh, establishment of safety zones around operations on the moon or other celestial bodies. Um, obviously, the safety zones can be uh, are important, but they have to be uh, compliant with certain rules. And by the way, this was also a principle suggested in the uh, Hague building blocks. China and Russia suggested a similar uh, proposal, the International Lunar Research Station. About eight states have now signed up to that. And very recently, I put the reference there, uh, a submission was uh, sent by China to UN Corpus that uh, lays out China's views on uh, space resource activities and contains quite similar uh, elements as the Artemis Accords. A few final words about what uh, UN COPOS has been doing. So we know that an agenda item was adopted in 2017. In 2019, a proposal for a working group was uh, was made, was accepted, which was established in 2021, and then will work for five years until 2027. This month, uh, an expert meeting will take place in Luxembourg, and next month, an international conference in Vienna. So these are the first two concrete activities of the working group uh, that will occur. The expert meeting uh, will include non-state uh, um, uh, stakeholders' views, and then the, uh, the, the international conference will, of course, contain uh, state representatives and statements. So we will see how that will move forward. Um, my point of view is that uh, the, the national laws are perhaps were uh, a game changer, were a start, a kickoff for the discussions, but uh, the having more of them will lead to fragmentation. Uh, and even though COPOS may take a longer time, in the end, that will mean that we get an inclusive and uh, comprehensive regime. And uh, possibly some alternatives can also develop in uh, in parallel. I am a strong believer of the concept of adaptive governance. We should try to regulate what is uh, visible for now and not go too far in the future and adapt uh, uh, the regime as necessary. It's clear that uh, legal certainty is needed and that some issues will require global agreement like equitable sharing of benefits or long-term sustainability. And therefore, I think also it is important that we support COPOS as the main forum, uh, even though uh, all the interests of the different stakeholders, including non-stakeholders, should be acknowledged. And I give the floor back and will stop sharing. And thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanya, for this uh, inclusive, really, um, presentation. You covered most of the all, all the legal aspects for the moment. I will. Uh, I have several questions to uh, um, to you, but uh, I will uh, leave them uh, after giving the passing the floor to the the other two speakers in order to have time after your speeches to interact among you. I have several questions. Thank you very much. I just want to highlight. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the impressive uh, presence, as you said, of uh, the uh, uh, the private sector uh, in uh, in um, uh, space exploration, which led uh, 
to issues uh, concerning the interpretation, let's say, if I may use the term, or application of the Outer Space Treaty, which uh, um, um, uh, led to the, the um, uh, creation of uh, new uh, multilateral cooperation schemes, as is the Artemis Accords, as is also the China, the Chinese and Russian initiative. Uh, but uh, I will, um, I will, uh, we will elaborate uh, later on. So now I pass the floor. Uh, to uh, Joao Zvedo, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the Nova School of Law and FCT scholarship holder. Uh, his research focuses on space resource activities and benefit sharing mechanisms. He's a coordinator and researcher at the Space Law Research Center of Portugal and a member of the European Center for Space Law and pro prospective member of the International Institute of Space Law. Joao, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon and, and good morning or good evening. Hopefully you can uh, all hear me well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Papathanasio, for uh, your introduction. Um, and I also would like to thank again to our organizing committee and to the Portuguese Space Agency for the, the invitation. So I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. And I feel less subconscious about it now because Professor Tanya actually, we would have very similar, I think, um, PowerPoint presentations uh, because I'm also here um, and I would like to address uh, some legal issues that surround space resource activities. Uh, and so now I had this amazing presentation before me that sets all the, the scenarios, so I'll just focus. And because I was thinking about it yesterday, this is such a big discussion that we need to have like in, in legal terms, like how do we address it? And I thought, well, we address it by doing a checklist uh, and a roadmap. We are, after all, on the road for the summit of the future. And, um, and in, we already mentioned policy brief seven, in, but also in the current zero draft for the pact of the future, which you know does not have a specific chapter on, on outer space, but in, trans, in chapter five on transforming global governance does address uh, outer space. It is mentioned, we commit to urgently developing frameworks for international cooperation in several areas, one of them being space resource activities. And in fact, it is true. Um, to what we need uh, more now is to have clear um, framework to, to provide legal certainty, right? And so I thought, okay, addressing this, we do a checklist first of things that, uh, and I, I do not propose all the answers, but in terms of divergent interpretations, maybe I, I can provide my inputs. The first being, and I feel like this is something that we are ready to answer now is, of course, on the legality of space resource activities. For me, space resource activities are, of course, allowed. And I, I also believe that this is according to Outer Space Treaty uh, Article 1, because they're allowed by the freedom of use of outer space. Uh, for, for me, this is like an item that we check on, uh, on that checklist, um, on, that we establish firmly on a set of principles. Uh, but we move to a second item on which is also found in Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty, and it comes to something that Professor Tony was saying, which is uh, the idea of uh, use and exploration of space as province of all humankind. And for me, this is precisely what allows us to say that space is global commons. And there are different you know, ways of explaining global commons. There's the economic definition, there's the legal definition, the legal def definition being more tr tricky. So I avoid it. Uh, for the sound bites, you can say that I agree that space is a global commons, even in, in a legal matter. In economic, it definitely is uh, a global commons. But province of all humankind, for me, reflects what is a uh, res communis approach. So in a sense, um, in trying to specify, because this is also important for space resource activities and their you know, legal framework, in trying to specify the, the nature of outer space, we can talk about this. And this is the, the first threshold, which is saying you know, there's freedom of access. Uh, and as long as you respect the ongoing obligations, you can go to space and perform your space activities, which include space resource activities. And this is why I also feel we need um, a proper and in my perspective, legally binding international framework, um, because this 
gives a lot of space. And if you think about it, it's very similar to the idea that we had during the discoveries age, right? In a sense that I go, um, I exploit, um, so on and so forth. And as long as I respect, in this case, an established set of rules, I can do it. There's no, uh, and even considering the common interests and benefits clause, the idea that use and exploration in space needs to be done considering the common interests and, and benefits um, um, of, of all states, there is no positive obligation, for instance, for sharing benefits. And I feel this is very problematic. And as you heard, this is benefit sharing mechanisms is the topic of my PhD thesis. Uh, I have not concluded it uh, yet, but I feel it's very problematic to have this sort of, you know, laissez-faire um, approach to space resource activities. And this is why I also agree that just leaving the matter to domestic legislation, it's, it's, it's not good enough. It risks fragmentation, but also risks race to the bottoms, you know, resource depletion, etc. But there's another legal issue that we need to reach an international consensus, you know, we need to start reaching consensual interpretation of the current body of uh, international space law. And that comes with the idea of what about the ownership of space resources, right? And especially vis-a-vis -vis Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty and the prohibition of national appropriation. And for me, I would look at this uh, this way. The Moon Agreement, although uh, with, um, with uh, a low number of ratifications, now 17, um, states parties um, has at least helped in something, which is for me to clarify that the ownership of extracted resources and underlining extracted resources is possible um, and is allowed. If, and I would say this, which um, is interesting because uh, as Professor Tanya said, the, the, uh, there is, the Moon Agreement doesn't um, you know, it's there's a lot of different interpretations, especially regarding common heritage of humankind and, and, and states were, you know, careful to accede to it. But without the Moon Agreement, I could see an interpretation where we could construe saying that the prohibition of national appropriation would not allow for the ownership of space resources. But with the Moon Agreement, I would say that ownership of extracted resources is allowed. But though all of this is, you know, uh, far and well, and uh, it's all good, but as it was mentioned also uh, before, there is a concern um, that, for me, is the main and the most important legal issue that we have to discuss. And we, it's fine. We are going to start probably with in situ resource utilization, so not fully fledged commercial exploitation of resources, but we are going to reach that at some point. So it's fine to start with a set of principles, but we do need a specific legal framework for space resource activities and one that includes uh, benefit and mechanisms and addresses the distributive effects uh, of space resource activities. Uh, and for instance, if we consider in the fact of the future, chapter one, it's mentioned, um, you know, the funding for development, we can address that with implementing benefit sharing mechanisms uh, for space resource activities. There are different types of benefit sharing mechanisms. There is, you know, capacity building, et cetera. And of course, I'm a big supporter of using capacity building. But I also think actually that we need more tangible benefit sharing. And my proposal on this matter would be, of course, to discuss an international fund um, um, from, you know, um, where you would pay, um, you would, would there, there would be payments resulting from the benefits, uh, financial benefits of space resource activities. And I know this is a very controversial topic. Um, so I would sideline it for, you know, the, the first discussions that we are going to have. But I do need, uh, I do think that we need to start uh, thinking about issues of scientific and commercial reserves. And this is mostly because um, we have, uh, this is, visible and clear, we do have um, technological gaps, right? And, you know, as I said uh, before, uh, in the discoveries, we had this approach of uh, I go, I explore it, it's mine. And the thing is, that led to global asymmetry. And I feel like in space resource activities, at first, uh, ISRU for supporting scientific missions 
it's fine, but fully fledged commercial exploitation of space resources uh, has a lot of potential to result in increasing global asymmetry. So we need to start thinking how we're going to effectively use space resources to address uh, issues on Earth, issues that include social justice. And, and, and so I would also uh, consider the situation, the idea of scientific reserves, of course, to avoid depletion of resources that can be used for scientific investigation, scientific missions, but commercial resort, uh, reserves to allow that those uh, states without the technological capability to start resource exploitation, um, at least in the upcoming 15 to 20 years, can do so in the future so as to avoid uh, global symmetry. And uh, I will conclude with this. I just wanted to give mostly to discussion food for thought. I think our um, main contributions, or at least mine, will come afterwards. I wanted to clarify some legal assumptions that I have, and which I feel this is where we need to start. We need to start clarifying global assumptions that we had. And I know that issues on benefit sharing mechanisms are not necessarily you know, consensual, but I do really uh, uh, feel that we need to, to address this uh, in an international framework. Thank you very much, uh, Joao. Um, I would like to say that you raised a very important points and uh, you gave us food of thought, food for thought for uh, our later discussion. Um, issues such as the, the Article 1 of the um, Outer Space Treaty, the national uh, legislation issue, the ownership of extracted, extracted uh, uh, space resources are very important and uh, I would like so much to, to have the time to, to, to discuss them uh, during our interaction. Uh, for uh, time, uh, due to time constraint, I have to pass the floor now to Thomas, Thomas Krosensky, uh, who is a senior researcher and lead on European engagement at the European Space Policy Institute. Uh, his research work has focused primarily on space sustainability, space security and European space policy. Previously, he was a visiting Fulbright Scholar at the Space Policy Institute of the George Washington University, a researcher for the Space Security Index 2017 and a member of the Slovak delegation to the UN COPOS. So, Thomas, you have the floor. Thank you, Artemis, for giving me the floor and also thank you to uh, to the organizers so for, for bringing in the, the, the perspective that, uh, that the European Space Policy Institute uh, can offer for this uh, for this conversation. I come from or I represent uh, an organization that is, uh, that is a not-for-profit think tank that uh, is primarily focused on uh, providing uh, 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 an advice uh, to decision makers and providing a po policy focused advice on the decision makers. So in my remarks, I will try to provide um, also just a few thoughts, not, not too much, hopefully, uh, from a perspective that may be complementary to, to what we have seen, more, maybe more on the on the technical road mapping side and also on uh, the, the legal regulatory side with uh, a focus that I believe will, will, will mostly be on the dimension of, of, of public policy making on the way to, uh, for the future as we are part of a policy symposium and I think in, in that regard uh, uh, if, if I try to really cut, cut away myself from the from the discussion that has been that has been just just mentioned and, and look at how uh, uh, we uh, how what will be the way ahead for public policy in in space resources um, activities, one, one thing, and maybe this would be the key point that I would probably try to to, to, to look into, and and Gerald uh, to some extent has addressed it in, in in his concluding words, is really looking into the the segment, uh, looking into the detail of the segment of space resources activities, how this can contribute to the challenges of societies and economies, and what we always try to have, and as, as, a, as a as a person working in the in the space policy field that the issue that we are also fa always facing in the space bubble is we are not really being able to kind of um, go further outward into from space policy from impact on space on broader policy so really the the policy impact of space and it which is maybe more pronounced in domains such as earth observation or, or navigation really in the applications is visible where it might not be as visible uh, in in some of the other more still exotic topics such as this one for maybe the outsider uh, the outsider audience and I think 
maybe what, what I'm missing uh, so far in that conversation to be maybe more visible compared to, to other themes that we are discussing when discussing space resources activities is really this is really these benefits, outward looking benefits um, that this can actually provide uh, beyond the segment or beyond the, the domain or beyond the expertise and beyond the community that is directly involved with it, be it lawyers, being engineers, uh, being anyone else. And I think the example that, that maybe not is brought so much into the conversation, but which can also provide uh, some avenues forward in garnering greater policy support for space resources activities as an activity in itself, would be to uh, seek for options where we can ensure, uh, bluntly speaking, funding, but really more broadly, where we can ensure policy buy-in from really benefactors or users of that technology or users of that segment of, of activity. And an interesting example in that regard, where we maybe don't hear so much, would be satellite meteorology, where uh, in our European example, I'm speaking this as a European speaker, the example of UMETSAT as a meteorological, operational meteorological entity is an interesting example of being able to garner financial resources or for an activity that has a societal benefit, but that does not originate in, let's say, the space ministries or space agencies, or not only from space ministries and space agencies. And here, really, you have an activity that as, a, as an interesting benefit, uh, as an interesting model, that I'm not sure that is specifically applicable to space resources, but really to this dimension of space activities where we are really looking further out into the solar systems with whatever uh, it takes. The more we are able as a, com as a community that deals with this, garner support from maybe the future users, future benefactors um, here on Earth, the more I think we're also to able to drive uh, uh, more responsible and, and, and more uh, uh, sustainable growth. So really it's all about ensuring that there are existing maybe models of how uh, other components of the space sector has been operating so far. And I uh, personally have a feeling that we may have not really introduced that, that reflection uh, uh, to the discussion or on some of the topics that relate maybe more closely to, to space exploration or to, to, to science and activities on other on other celestial bodies. And the other the, the other thing and uh, that I would maybe mention, and this relates Artemis to, 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 to what you also asked us to do, was maybe also to look more into the details of the outcomes of the technical symposium and what the technical symposium has discussed on the topic of, of space resources. I, I, I think the, 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 the discussion at the technical symposium really touched some of the some of the topics which are which are maybe still quite obvious but that still to some extent remain remain valid for the discussion in terms of uh, how uh, i would put nations or countries are still maybe the primary entities that develop and implement uh, policies in that regard uh, uh, do is now what 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 principles should should we should we look into further integrating in the in the in the domain and here i would I would really underline, or at least my personal conviction of the validity of what we are seeing in the, some of the more pragmatic approaches. So it's one thing, it's really about having the, the, the long-term ideal ideal vision and, and the needs. And I think the, the, the legal experts panel rightly put that forward as something which eventually, I believe everyone wants or, or, or seeks to, to go through, even though our legal understanding or arguments may not yet be so well aligned as we wish them to be. But there is also, besides this long-term vision, there is a validity in going with uh, with the smaller scale approaches that may be differ in, in some way or, or another. And I think this actually strives and drives the agenda and drives the agenda further than just the sheer example of of having uh, in recent years having a few um, let's put it like a few countries that that came up with with national approaches and even on the legal and regulatory side have advanced the reflection i, I still remember maybe five ten years ago the discussion always um still pretty much often targeted the even even there is a legal possibility to, to do these sorts of activities and now even some of my previous speakers have, have mentioned i believe we generally have moved as a community in our understanding from discussion whether yes or no whether really almost everyone sharing the view that yes this is something which is by default allowed and on the other hand which is something that will continue to be to be explored uh, because maybe again echoing the words of Gerald, this is something that will remain and has a clear impact as a 
as an enabling function for whatever we want want to do in the future on the on the celestial body so i think that's that's a trend that that is that is uh, 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 certainly positive with challenges remaining on the way but that validity of the more pragmatic approaches in national space policy making i think it's something which will eventually drive the agenda forward even though it may introduce maybe on the legal and regulatory side conflict conflicting views uh, in the short uh, uh, to medium term um, on my side, that's that's again all for the uh, for the introductory words, and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for uh, uh, your contribution. Really, um, your reflections are very important, and uh, uh, you said uh, you you uh, submitted uh, some uh, pragmatical positions that we might have the time to discuss later on. So I think that uh, we concluded with um, the, the presentations. Um, first of all, I would like to address a question which uh, could start an interaction among you all. My question goes first uh, to Gerald. And the things that uh, uh, Gerald said uh, during uh, his presentation uh, that uh, uh, he underlined that planetary preservation is important in responsibly using space resources. And this, to my view, raises the question uh, of what uh, would be um, uh, the environmental implications of uh, uh, in situ resource utilization and in general the, the exploration, exploitation, utilization of outer space resources. And um, we can have, uh, for instance, specific questions and I'm addressing to you all. First of all, I will give the floor to Gerald but uh, the questions are, uh, uh, for instance, uh, how shall we ensure that the entities active in the area of space resources take the space environment into account? Or uh, how shall we ensure that uh, they use the best possible and least invasive technology? Or uh, should they restore the mining area after finishing their task? So I'm leaving the, the, the floor to you, starting from Gerald, and then uh, all of you can uh, interact. Well, interestingly enough, um, we did start to talk about all of those issues in the paper that I, I mentioned um, that we released last October. Um, and so to begin with, the, the 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 brief roadmap that I showed you has, you know, in theory, two two kind of demonstrations leading to our first end-to-end -end operations. Um, recognize that those are very small demonstrations to begin with. Um, even the end-to-end -end system most likely will not be a large-scale um, operation per se. We look at doing those um, lunar activities. Uh, both from a technical perspective as well as from an environmental perspective, understanding what's going on. And so in a request for information that we released on our first demonstration last October, we actually put in, besides the type of instruments you would use to test your and understand the performance of your operations, what also would you do to understand your environmental impacts? Um, you know, understanding venting, releasing activities, dust lofting, things like that. Um, so these are considerations that we want to start embedding into our designs to begin with. Now, before we fly anything to the moon, we're going to be doing a lot of activities on Earth um, in vacuum chambers and analog tests. So that will also give us some level of indication as to what the environmental impacts might be. <clears throat> um, and, and please recognize that a precise mining operation actually will be more likely to have lower mass and lower energy than one that just throws things left and right and, and vents lots of, of consumables and, and reactants. So, so these are things that we're thinking about. Um, and, and the paper talks about considerations design considerations because at this point we don't know enough to 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 over specify yet um, those things that people need to do that's the whole point of the the ground and lunar testing is to learn and not over specify but at the same time take those lessons learned and apply them to to future um, efforts and the last thing i would do want to mention is the science so a lot of people say oh 
Um, if you do space mining, you're going to ruin the environment. You're going to stop people from doing science. And I like to point out that if you are actually going into a permanently shadowed region, region looking for water, the extent of measurements that you need to perform to find and locate and quantify that, that water resource or mineral resource is going to far exceed any of the science missions that we are currently planning. So if I go into a shadowed region, that region will have a tremendous amount of science information. And one of the charts, that busy chart th that I showed, I think shows that range of science information. So I hope that covers at least the technical part before turning it over yes. to my panelists. Thank you very much. I, I will ask um, um, our speakers if you want to, to, to um, contribute to, to this question. If not, I will proceed because the, the, it. May, yes, Tanya, I will give you the. I will give you the floor directly. I, I would like just to say that uh, I see in the chat that there are several questions from our public, virtual public. So it would be fair to. To, to deal um, after giving the floor to Tanya to the with the questions uh, from our public because they are very important and are addressed to to, to different uh, to our different speakers today. So Tanya, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add very briefly on this issue of uh, um, environmental protection, planetary protection, also the role of uh, COSPAR, the Committee on Space Research, which, as you know, has a planetary protection policy, which has been observed by uh, states for uh, decades, actually since the beginning of the space age, and by agencies and so on, yeah, which is also a non-binding uh, uh, set of principles uh, linked indirectly to Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which I mentioned. And the challenge will be, since we will have private missions to the moon, that the national uh, regulators who have to exercise authorization and supervision will also uh, include the observation of the COSPAR planetary protection in their considerations on licensing private activities. Um, and so we see that these policies are evolving over time as scientific insight grows. So, for instance, now there are different policies according to which region on the moon you're on um, and and so I think this is also uh, an increase in the in the burden or the, the, the obligation of states to carry out uh, wise oversight of uh, whatever the private entities plan to do thanks Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, I look at uh, the different um, uh, questions. It seems that two, uh, one question has already been uh, uh, responded by, uh, answered by uh, um, uh, Gerald. Um, so I will proceed with the next one. Um, uh, it is said uh, that, uh, do you think uh, that the need uh, for a new international legal framework related to space resources activities has become necessary? Actually, this is a very um, important question, which also coincide, uh, coincides with my uh, intention to, to make this question to the, the legal, uh, let's say, uh, team of uh, our panel. So I addressed the question first to Joao, who didn't speak. Um, yeah. Um, the questions and then to Thomas. Okay. Um, and Dan, of course. So, I mean, as I said, I feel that an international uh, legal framework is necessary, um, especially in the long run. But uh, as, as I mentioned before, and because we were starting with the uh, ISRU and supporting missions, etc., we can start, and this also follows, you know, the, the notion of adaptive governance. We, we, we can start with a set of principles. I feel that's fine. As long as they reflect, you know, an international consensus on, 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 on legal um, issues. And hence why I said Article 1, Article 2, we can start by stating uh, uh, the specific um, types of interpretation and by agreeing this because we can start with that. I just feel that in the long run, and in, in, in the face of fully fledged commercial um, exploitation, an international legal framework is necessary, and, and mostly to to address beneficiary mechanisms and and etc. But also there are uh, other issues that we need to to consider, okay. for instance, registration, liability, etc. 
Uh, I think that uh, the question, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this question, uh, uh, how does uh, uh, justification the fact that uh, uh, the um, uh, certain articles of the 1967 treaty uh, are of general nature, so um, they raise uh, questions of interpretation. Um, uh, by states uh, of these provisions. Um, Thomas, any views? Or Tanya, who would like first to take the floor? I can I can quickly take the action. Yes, I would, Thomas. Uh, maybe echo the, the 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 element or the the dimension that Joao uh, not noted on the the, the long term aspect in, in 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 that in that setting. Uh, but in the short to medium term, I, I we need to ask you know, necessary f f from which perspective or for for what uh, and. And, and again, maybe from more of the pr practitioner's point of view of whoever is, is trying to engage in an activity, be it for a scientific reason or being for a commercial commercial reason, I uh, understand reading reading the landscape currently that while we may not even be in a situation of, of, of having a, a, f a framework or frameworks that, that provide uh, uh, elements that are, have even been raised at the, tech, at the technical symposium by the by the technical community in terms of the regulatory certainty for let's say for investment or for funding that may come from the private sector. If this is not stopping anyone, into, uh, this is not really stopping the community to take proactive approach. So it depends from which angle are we looking into those things. Uh, that that ideal vision of, of of an existence of a long term uh of a, of a permanent international legal framework is something that i would also echo but at the same time i don't think we are the situation which is preventing innovation to happen with the regime that we have right now actually as uh, tanya presented in her presentation previously there is an ongoing work within the working group uh, on legal aspects of space resource activities of the legal subcommittee of copos and I see here uh, a question specifically addressed uh, by Merve Erdem to address to Tanya. Thank you very much, he says, for the presentation, Tanya. I would like uh, to hear more about the adaptive, adaptive governance and especially the role of international lawmaking with the adaptive governance. Yeah, thank you, Artemis, and thank you, Merve, for this uh, question. And um, uh, I mentioned it because this was also the leading uh, principle with which we drafted the uh, Hague Working Group's uh, work and the building blocks that we made. The idea is basically that you uh, regulate the um, uh, or that you address the topics that are currently realistically going to happen. Uh, and, and one example is we should regulate activities of resources Oh, in outer space, but sorry, uh, we should active. We should regulate activities for in situ resource utilization, but the eventual possible uh, bringing back of um, uh, of resources to Earth is something that may happen in maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, Gerald can maybe tell us what the realistic uh, timeline for that is. So let's see that and, and regulate that when we get there. And so um, the idea is to be pragmatic. And uh, that is also why I would agree with other speakers that, yes, of course, it would be nice to have <clears throat> an international treaty on space resource activities, but we all also all know that that may not happen uh, today or tomorrow and so having sets of guidelines or at least recommendations to states to regulate those private activities because I think in the end a lot will come to national law uh, that at least we have some guiding principles that will promote some harmony among those national legislations that will go uh, a long way and if you look at the the of course the, the outer space treaty gives only general principles that is well known it doesn't go into detail, but that was also never the intention of the drafters of the treaty. And the, the word principles is in the title of the treaty. And so the time is coming, and I think that is what the, the founding fathers realized. We couldn't know in 1960s uh, what was going to be possible. And now we do have to provide that clarity and fill those gaps and, and complete the, the, uh, the legal system. And so that is what I mean with adaptive governance, doing it step by step in the form of uh, uh, recommendations or guidelines and perhaps in the future a treaty we should of course continue to strive for that highest uh, ideal solution thank you very much tanya if you want my insight my uh, uh, contribution to this discussion i would say i mean this is a personal view that uh, i notice 
um, in general that, um, uh, okay, as you said, uh, the, the five United Nations uh, conventions uh, on uh, space law were um, elaborated uh, uh, at a period of time when uh, um, uh, nations uh, would like, states would like to, to impose uh, some uh, uh, general principles and uh, it, but the uh, most of their provisions are um, uh, formulated in in a general way, uh, but it seems that uh, after the involvement of the private sector, things changed, and it seems that states are not so much willing lately to to proceed with international conventions. Uh, rather, uh, um, they they prefer to to, to proceed with uh, um, international governance uh, uh, codes uh, or uh, general principles or. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, regulatory texts, but not uh, of a binding, uh, in a binding form, not uh, elaborated in a binding form. So, and I will uh, proceed with another and the last, I think, question uh, from Andy Sharma, uh, who asks, what are the perspectives of the private sector actors in this policy arena and how will they be incorporated in any future international policy development? Uh, Thomas, Joao, Tanya, Cheryl. I can I can maybe take uh, a perspective of uh, maybe trying to compare where we are in the situation maybe with uh, with other parts of the space sector that has that has gone through in the past and what has I would say maybe generally been a a, a, a pattern that that has that has been visible in other in other segments of the the space sector was that with with these new types of technology or new types of technological activities uh, the, the commercial activity understandably if it comes it comes later after the process after the, the the role of the public actors has been in the initial research and in, in development side and uh, my my reading of, of the landscape in space resources activities is still we are mostly in those early stages when when uh, when the, the, the role of agencies uh, becomes uh, remains still very high in kind of ensuring that the, the, the early stages or the, the low uh, TRLs have been secured in a way that it can be taken over at, towards the uh, towards the industry and the private sector. Now, then, the more difficult questions may arise, just from the perspective of what the uh, how the public policy will reflect. Uh, Putting aside a bit, maybe the legal and regulatory side, what what the public policy will take on board as as a, as a tool, what it wants to do with the private sector. What I have in mind is that we have really seen some of the the smart tools or smart policy actions where the roles of agencies have gradually roles of public actors have been shifting from really being the owners, the builders, the operators of infrastructures, in being the enablers of this thing, being, being conducting more. Where the questions becomes a bit more philosophical if this is what we want to do. Uh, I, I would argue that if we believe in the more of the, 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 the liberal economic approach, you would, you would believe that there is a role for commercial actors to play to decrease the cost and to drive the innovation. So I think we, just to sum it up, I think we're still mostly in those in those early stages with and a crucial uh, with a crucial role of uh, the public actors and agencies in kind of de-risking and enabling that this can eventually become an action uh, or become a, a domain of activities that has a viability um, to be engaged at the private level on the commercial or business uh, dynamics that have yet to be proven at this stage. Thank you very much and allow me now to make a question to Gerald which is technical and uh, excuse me if it is not the proper one but uh, it comes to my mind like this in the technical virtual symposium of november it was highlighted by speakers that the focus should be on using resources uh, in space in situ rather than bringing them back to earth and uh, i would like to hear your view as a lead in situ resource utilization so, so two things. Um, one is to go back slightly to the last comment about the regulatory and the private sector. Um, everything that I've heard from both the space private sector and the terrestrial mining private sector, um, there are barriers to entry in investment and trying to understand the uh, having a stable um, financial and regulatory regime to some extent is key for investment. So, so while we're doing these smaller activities, um, 
having that vision of where we're going, the principles in place um, is strongly needed to keep that investment and that, that work going. Um, now, um, I'm sorry, Artemis, please remind me of the, the, the question from the technical perspective. The, the question is, what is your view? Um, uh, I mean, oh, bringing uh, resources bringing back to Earth. Uh, them back to yep. Earth or keeping them, using them so, for the in situ. So the interesting, so the interesting thing about space resources and ISRU compared to other technologies for human exploration is that to use ISRU, you require a return on investment in one way or another. It's it's an economical question. Do I bring a tank of propellant from the earth or do I make it in situ? If I bring the tank over and over again compared to setting up, you know, shop, certain mass, certain power needs to go into making that propellant in the first place. So from an economic point of view, just like on earth, the farther you transfer a product to a customer, the more the costs rise. So the real big question is, is it economical to extract something on the moon and bring it back to Earth, taking in the transportation cost, taking in the, the mining operations and everything like that in comparison to selling that product? Um, at this point, there hasn't really been anything mentioned. Uh, you know, somebody has mentioned helium-3, for example, that there is a terrestrial market. It is actually very expensive, helium-3, terrestrially, but nobody has made the economic case yet for establishing a mining operation, extracting the helium-3, and then sending it back to Earth. So, so again, I think, as, as uh, Tanya said, it's, it's something that may happen. Um, and we may learn as we go along, but it is not anything in the near future. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I think that uh, uh, there is a last question from the our virtual public, which rather is rather addressed to you, Gerald. Uh, uh, the question is from Camille Mizika. She says um, he's or she says would fully development de would fully developed settlements be obligated to share their mining profits with old earth? Won't it be another form of colonial exploitation? Um, that is above and beyond my technical um, <laughs> aspects, and I think that so actually well, does come like into to some do. of the things Maybe that, Tanya, that yes, the Tanya. other speakers have been yes. talking about. Tanya? Thank you. Yes, I don't think I heard anyone say that that is how sharing benefits should be interpreted. I think Joao mentioned some uh, interesting ideas about, for instance, a fund or whatever, and that is only one of the ideas. I do remember that when we had our uh, very interesting discussions during the Hague Working Group, uh, the, the concept of sharing benefits was probably uh, the most complex one and, and uh, will be the most challenging one to make sure that this exciting new activity can indeed uh, be pursued uh, with the acceptance of the entire uh, uh, community of states. And that is, of course, essential also for those pioneers who are going to do that, that it is accepted by others as legitimate and useful and beneficial. And uh, I don't think anybody said that we would share every dollar made in 293 uh, little pieces, or as many as UN members there are. But the, the challenge challenge will be to find uh, good ways of sharing benefits and that can also be in uh, building capacity or outsourcing work or sharing scientific results uh, or indeed putting a percentage of profit in a, in a fund and use that for further investments or allowing uh, states with uh, uh, less technology to participate. I'm just talking from the top of my head there, but I don't think any of the panelists here suggested that, uh, um, that it would be a colonial exploitation as you call it. And maybe if I can just come back quickly to the point of how the private industry sees this. I remember a congressional hearing that took place in the States, uh, in the United States a few years ago, where this question of whether should we uh, just uh, put the Outer Space Treaty in the bin and start over again or, or just get away with it. And actually, 
the industry was very much in favor of keeping the treaty and said they can work with the treaty and it does provide them with an initial uh, legal certainty, which is so important. So I think that we can be confident that even uh, the private industry is interested in, uh, in having a legal framework because that will also give confidence to their investors and, uh, and to their activities. And this leads us uh, uh, to back to one of the uh, points uh, raised by Joao about the national legislation and the ownership of extracted, extracted uh, space resources, uh, which to his view is possible. Uh, and I would like here to say that uh, uh, yes, uh, and uh, but the issue is that uh, we, as we very well know, that the exercise of national uh, jurisdiction thereby does not affect the legal status of outer space itself. So, yes, it can be, I mean, an ownership of uh, the extracted um, uh, space resources, but uh, this does not, uh, should not harm the legal and does not harm the legal status of outer space itself. Uh, Any other? Maybe, yes. maybe I, I can address this and I can track back also to the previous, uh, previously spoken two points uh, just to add uh, on the idea precisely that um, dealing with the private sector, it's very important to bring in, um, uh, you know, to have a global notion of all stakeholders, um, even when negotiating, you know, the initial principles, because we, whatever we establish, we don't want it to have a chokehold um, or to, to create a chokehold for, um, for commercial space activities, right? Um, but of course, and bringing to the parts connecting with the benefit sharing, that's why I said we need to create balances. And we do need to have some integration, I feel, with Earth, with Earth governance. We can just be, you know, um, in terms of public, especially in terms of public investment, we can just have public investments um, and in, into um, space resource activities and then not try also to have some integration and to have benefits on Earth. And mostly to say like the issue of colonial exploitation that's, that's mentioned, I mean, I see that human settlements that we establish uh, on space, at first they have a big connection to Earth, right? They, they'll, the permanent human um, presence in space, first we will need rendezvous still, and we'll need to come back and forth. But as Tony said, yeah, my point is not on saying that we need to bring everything back and we need to pump back everything on Earth, but we do need, you know, to have, because we cannot just justify the, uh, we cannot, um, especially for space resource activities, yes, they will be overall in an abstract manner beneficial for humankind, but we cannot just say, you know, they're beneficial for humankind and then what? Right. Um, so in it and is and now creating the bridge of national legislation as well, because precisely in the sense that, uh, and that's why I say that national legislation is not enough, because you know in national legislation you'll find this idea. Well, it will be, be beneficial for uh, our country, um, etc., and it will create jobs, so on and so forth. But then the question is exactly how, right? Uh, we cannot keep selling this idea of it's beneficial for all if it's just going to lead to, you know, a small, to benefits for a small share, right? And this is why we need to balance things. We don't want to establish a chokehold on economic activities, but also we need to create a balance and, and see benefits for all. For uh, Regarding the issue of the, the nature, my thing is, and I agree with Tony on this. Maybe we stop, <laughs> you know, just enacting national legislation on the issue because, and I agree, it was very good for discussions. Look, I started doing research on space resource activities eight years ago, and I feel like there wasn't this much, much discussion. So I'm super happy that now we are actively um, starting to address, starting to have symposium, starting to understand, okay, we, what we need to say. But the, the truth of the matter is, for me, I still have an issue, which is it's OK to say uh, that we recognize that it's possible ownership of space resource activities. My issue is, for instance, if one specific country does so, the, some other specific country, if it disagrees in, in interpretation, it's not legally bound to recognize that, right? 
that's why we need international set of principles to say that uh, and not just national law because some other country will say well but I, I don't need to to agree with it if I disagree with the interpretation of you know body of space law like do I am I forced to agree with that that okay you recognize ownership to your enterprises do I need to recognize ownership of space resources to your enterprises etc right so this is why I feel international okay. set of principles <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I think that um, it was a very, uh, if no one else wants to, to say uh, anything, and there are no other questions, as I see, I think that we had uh, um, uh, quite an inclusive um, uh, interaction and conversation uh, uh, following your presentations. Uh, from my part, as a moderator, I thank you very much for this interaction. It was an honor to be with you today. And many thanks to the uh, Portuguese uh, Space Agency for their invitation. I I now pass the floor to Hugo, Mr. Costa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Artemis, for excellent moderation of, of this panel. Thank you also for, for the panelists uh, for your insightful uh, shares. And uh, with this, we finalize, we uh, reached the end of our um, session today. We'll be back tomorrow with a different topic on space traffic management. Now, tomorrow we're going to have two sessions, one at 12 p.m. and another one at uh, 16 p.m. UTC time. Uh, so again, thank you very much to everyone. I wish you a lovely afternoon or evening, uh, depending where you are. And we'll see each other perhaps in, in May in our in-person event here in Lisbon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.